The 3,000 community members in Findhorn aim to be the world's example for a green city. You look around and you go, where the fuck am I? Located in northern Scotland, the residents use recycled whiskey vats to live in, and while studies show Findhorn has the lowest recorded ecological footprint of any community in the industrialized world, the more intriguing side of Findhorn lies with the people. We're always going to be probably seen as the slightly lunatic fringe. To be wholly sustainable, many people here practice spirituality by literally hugging trees to connect with the forest divas. I'm accused at times of cultural appropriation by indigenous peoples. Then, just before we arrived, a disgruntled employee burned down part of the city. So it's a really interesting moment that you're here, actually. What is the future of Fedora? That's what we'll see, just how evolved our consciousness actually is. <laughs> Why are we walking barefoot through the woods with a bottle of whiskey in our hands? What do you think? Well, I guess we'll find out. Along the northern Scottish coast is Fintorn a place many consider to be the first eco-village in the world, where every aspect of life is distinct. To find out what that means, we walked the city with Yvonne. It's really an amazing place in this remote corner of northern Scotland. I mean, that's why I'm still here after 21 years. Along with Yvonne, there are around 600 other residents, some of whom have built pretty interesting homes. You don't need to get a planning permit as long as the building is movable. To source timber, they've developed a forest, 50 years in the making, that generates firewood for heating homes and functions as a burial ground. Legally, we are allowed to bury people here. It's a, it's a very low impact way right. of, of dealing with the passing of the body. To sustainably live, the four wind turbines in Findhorn provide a surplus of electricity for the city. Let's go this way. The gardens at Findhorn provide over 70% of the community's dietary needs and bring in a healthy profit along with employing many of the residents. Magic is a word that people use about this place a lot. And we have our own currency. The offering of Findhorn's eco-currency has funded major construction projects. But another way residents can afford their endeavors is by sourcing used materials, like retired whiskey vats. The first of these whiskey barrel home builders who had been recognized around the world for his innovative architecture is Craig. Well, yeah, well this is it. it there's not, there, there is no other house like this. Who connected several barrels to create a 180 meter square home. This is your place. And there's another little barrel through there, and there's another bedroom down there, and there's a big studio space upstairs as well. So you, I mean, what, what was appealing to you when you first came out? You know, came the, out of where? <laughs> came out, out to here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did take my fair share of psychedelics and things like that, and they changed my attitude completely. And then I was diagnosed with cancer. So I had that sort of, you could say, sense of awakening to a larger picture. And then I was looking for where it was practiced. So you got the spot. And it's probably 70% upcycled. All the furniture, everything except for the stove and the fridge. And so you're and very, good at. very conscious about the footprint. You know, I've been here 52 years. So we were, you could say, conscious of what was happening to the planet. That was the early 70s, when the scientific community predicted an increase of 0.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Along with the predicted climate change, American cities were struggling with inescapable smog. Pollution was dangerous. It was happening in every city in the United States and around the world. One man who, well, actually did escape the smog was Craig's neighbor and former director of the Finthorn Eco Village, John Talbot, who immediately put me to work cleaning his gutters. I mean, in terms of like how these buildings function, what's different about them from your average house? The main thing, I suppose, is the use of natural materials, healthy materials, and then as much as possible trying to source mm -hmm. our timber. Mostly we're using timber frame housing. What is it for, the environment? What? Is it for the recycling? The recycling, the growing of your own food, is it uh, financial? No money. As we started to develop the Echo Village thing and started to build, there was lots of building materials, so I just started to build a house out of what was left over. Craig put around 25,000 British pounds into outfitting his 9,000 liter whiskey barrels into a comfortable living space. At the time, this was not seen as an investment, but rather as the only way Craig could afford a home. We've kind of been a victims of our own success because um, we started out, it was, it was very affordable, but we, um, the, the land price has gone up dramatically in the 30 years since we really started building. 
By the year 2000, global temperatures had risen by 0.6 degrees Celsius, and climate change was mainstream. Fighting climate change became big business, and now Craig's home is worth upwards of half a million pounds. And I'm turned out to be a yuppie now, but I'm, I'm not doing it for that. You know? mm -hmm. Why am I doing it? Because um, I want to live like this. Uh, I want to sort of, you could say, maybe demonstrate a little bit that you can do it. Yeah, look, look we'll just keep going because you're going to have a shitload of footage. Oh, maybe pick up your shoes. Okay. Jeez, your place never ends. <laughs> you know, here, here you are, you're in Utopia. This is Shambhala. Excuse yeah. me, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. But, you know, you look around and you go, excuse me, where the fuck am I? Uh, uh, Jesus, some significant bulbs going on. On that note, this is unique. I, I love the idea of using turf on a roof, if you can. It, so some of the aspects of the housing is just what you want it to be? Yeah, yeah, and also kind of fun, creative. Yeah, yeah, they look my, cool. <laughs> my motto in life is really, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. Like, you, we have, it, it, you can get so serious about all this stuff. We all will be dead. We still have too many people, too much pollution. But you gotta have fun doing it. Yeah. Like you can't be too heavy and too hard. So, right, right. Yeah. While Fintorn is outfitted with expensive solar technologies, giant wind turbines, and a biomass boiler, the community continues to borrow ideas from those that have lived with nature for generations. Finhorn represents um, an opportunity for we in the West to become indigenous again. Um, yeah, I mean, well, what's the difference between like an eco village and a village? Is it just like white people coming and making a community? I'm accused at times of cultural appropriation by indigenous peoples. I think we want to try to mimic what indigenous cultures haven't lost, uh, you know, because we were all once indigenous peoples. <laughs> you know, working with nature, that means working with the elements, working with the land, working with whatever, what is, whatever is given. But it is, it's this whole sense of transformation. We're going to keep going. And so we try to grow a lot of our own food. Holy crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so probably 50 to 70% of my own bodily waste goes into the garden, but it goes into the compost first. So that's the garden that feeds me, but this is the place that heats me. One of the things that I love right now is that all the wood that I'm burning, I help to plant and it's coming off the landscape that we've re recreated. Craig's home and way of life embodies the values found at the Findhorn Eco Village. But to understand the scale and how everything got to this point, we're going to need a little history with Chris. The year was 1962. Peter Caddy, a Brit, Dorothy McLean, a Canadian, and Eileen Caddy, an Egyptian, were managing the Clooney Hill Hotel in Foray, Scotland. This is where, while meditating, Eileen heard a voice talk to her. Believing she was in contact with extraterrestrials, the three cleared out a landing strip for UFOs near Clooney Hill. The hotel fired them. With no money and no home, Peter, Eileen, and Dorothy drove their caravan to a trailer park near the town of Findhorn. Without jobs, they began to grow their own food, which proved to have its challenges as the land was sandy and lacked nutrients. This is when Dorothy became a spirit channeler as well. She found that she could telepathically connect with the intelligence of plants. The angels and the devas, as she called them, instructed her on how to grow a garden suitable for her and her family. Dorothy was getting these messages from all the, the vegetables, the flowers, the herbs, and they ended up growing the legendary 40-pound cabbages, which is what Fintorn became famous for in the first place. Locals from the surrounding community attribute this to substantial piles of horse manure that the garden was planted on. Regardless, this attracted people to come and live in Fintorn. In 1983, the, the owners put the caravan park up for sale. So Eileen uh, did what I call is probably the first crowdfunding in the world. And with donations from around the world, Peter, Dorothy, and Eileen purchased the caravan park. And then, you know, people from all over started to come. There was a great influx of people from California in the 70s. And they all felt like they were pioneering a new paradigm for the world. 
This is when the Eco Village movement was born. The whiskey barrel houses were built, the wind turbines erected, and things are still being built to this day. One of those people still tending to the garden and producing food is Steve. Hi, Steve. Hello, I'm Steve. So you're kind of the lifeblood of the whole operation here, huh? Uh, that's one way of describing us. Yeah, and I mean, are you generating food here? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So we, we supply the community members and we have a cart that we put the food out on so all the community members can um, can go to the cart and buy local. So we're going to have local speakers that have their own local businesses coming to talk about how they uh, how they started their business, what are the challenges involved in starting your own local food business here in Moray. So it's a bit of a commune? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean I guess commune sometimes can have some uh, negative connotations, but yeah, people living together and working together and feeling that the sum of all the parts coming together is stronger than individuals, I suppose. So people live here for free? Uh, there isn't any monetary exchange, so I guess there are, it, it's, you know, the exchange is work and time and effort. Um, but it, it's not for money, no. Not for Findhorn coins? What <laughs> <laughs> After my strenuous work in the garden, I acquired a bottle of local single malt to share with my new friend Britta. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yes, generally I take off my shoes to walk to, through the woods if you want to do that. We must. There are many, like, nature tribes who believe that if you're not walking barefoot, you lose your connection to the earth. But um, we have something that's called the common ground that people The talk. common ground. For context, the common ground was something that just about everyone brought but up. But we do have a little set of um, kind of guidelines for living here called common ground. The common ground, has anyone mentioned that to you? We have a common ground. A set of principles and guidelines that all residents follow. The rules state that they live in acceptance and surrender and seek nothing less than freedom. To do this, they practice spirituality, use clear and open communication, and embody congruence of thought, among other things. Do you, what do you want to talk about? Well, I want to know your story. Ah, oh, okay. How did you find yourself a part of this village? So I was 31 and my partner had just died of cancer. I realized like, well, life can be over any minute, so I better do what I really want to do now. Then I found out about Fintorn. And when I saw it, I was like, this is what I want to do. I mean, it was like really clear. So we're at the beach. Yes. Do you think it's whiskey time? I think it's whiskey time. Oh, that fine. What do you want to know? I can tell you anything. Oh, I, know. I want to know everything. OK. Are the majority of people, you know, vegan, sort of tree hugging, stereotypical hippie eco folk? Did you give me the whiskey so I say yes to that? <laughs> and so there's everything. There are people who are hugging trees. I definitely hug trees and um, I think it's a good thing to do. Many believe that every living thing, trees, plants, the whole natural world has a unique spirit or deva and that they are the source of life. Devas, as lore has it, can live to be a thousand years old and often look like tiny humans. They spend their lives working with angels and spirits to materialize the blueprints of life into physical forms on Earth. When their work is complete, they die. We are also not like religious. It's not like that's a religion. It's like a set of agreements we agree to live by, but we are not following up how people are doing that. Yeah, well, to a long time here. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> As Harris and Britta tossed enough whiskey back to spawn a deva, I met with Roger, another transplant from California that was inspired to move here during the hippie revolution in San Francisco. Could everybody in the world live like this, like you live in Findorn? We would like to think so. You know, the one thing that's, that's become clear to the more eco-minded observers, including myself, is that we can't rely upon governments. Most nations have failed to be as ambitious as they need to be. Don't, don't, don't do it. We may not have an agreement today. We probably won't. Not again. A net zero emissions. We are no longer going to allow for plastic straws. Now more than three dozen bills pending in 22 states. Banning straws isn't going to do anything for the environment. 12% 
are prepared to actually voluntarily give up flying, giving up cars. I mean, people are assuming that the governments will solve the problem for us, and that ain't gonna happen. You know, it's gonna come down to basically all of us. Mm -hmm. And that basically means we're gonna have to take, start taking climate change seriously, respond accordingly. Are the most people here environmentally motivated? Or is it everybody? Um, no. Really? Well, it's called eco Look, I mean, a lot of people have been drawn by the spiritual hmm. aspect of the community. Okay. And they're prepared to sort of like go along with the eco stuff. But, you know, their primary interest is in new consciousness, talking to nature spirits, whatever. With inspiration from Eileen and Dorothy, Findhorn hosts a wide array of spiritual practices, including a morning singing chamber where Harris met with one of the leaders. So the meditation is how you get the day going? This may sound a bit wacky, but, you know, Eileen would talk about, you know, asking to be cleansed and purified so that we start each day with a brand new slate. And what if you come and you're not a religious person? Well, you see, you're using the word religious, whereas we would call spiritual. Okay. You know, so spiritual, we're all actually spiritual beings. On the outside, Findhorn has many elements. But at its core, there is a spiritual side that ties everything together and is an element they believe needs to exist in order to be fully sustainable. To enhance this feeling, Kathy and other community members created a special so system. Do you have to be religious to kind of fit in here? No, not at all, in fact. You can be. But it's not, there isn't a particular dogma or teaching that any one person is subscribed to. It's more about finding what it is inside you that is, that is most meaningful and most connecting. Near the center of town, the community center and sanctuary hosted many spiritual events for residents. These two buildings were both funded in part by the offering of the Findhorn Eco Currency. Years before, cryptocurrencies essentially did the same thing to raise money. It was an astonishing community feat, one that was tarnished by a single man who had been let go from the Findhorn Foundation due to financial struggles from the pandemic. He had been made redundant, uh, so had many people. Joseph Clark, the very man that managed the community center, sought what he thought was revenge. It was the day of my birthday. I'll never forget it. <laughs> I woke up in the morning and I smelled, I, I thought somebody had new firewood, right? Clark burned both the community center and sanctuary to the ground. And while Findhorn does have plans to replace these two buildings, the community here is in a time of reflection. It's made me think a lot about the transient nature, myself, you know, um, how long will it last and what will be here, what will be here for my kids and their kids. Um. It's a beautiful playground. It's a wonderful place, this planet Earth. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel to learn about other fascinating communities like Findhorn. And I've got a chance to sit here and, and you guys do this and then, uh, yeah, I'll be deeply embarrassed by what I see uh, when you put it on. <laughs>